Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Mana Ministry. Here we are yet again for another episode in our current mental health series entitled Truth Prescriptions. My name is Chriselle Olasarana. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. And joining along as my co host is. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Katie Elson. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. Yeah, so thank you for joining us. Now, a brief disclaimer, just to speak on the intent of our series, that it's not to provide nor even to substitute for professional advice, diagnosis, or even treatment. Rather, our purpose is to provide spiritual guidance, and more specifically, how can we utilize the Bible as a practical guide for our mental health? We do encourage you to please always seek any advice that you may need um, from a mental health professional regarding any condition that you currently have. Yes, and if for some reason you are in a crisis, um, we encourage you to either call 911 or specifically if you're suicidal, you can call this number on the screen, 1-800-273-TALK, and then you can talk to a skilled counselor that can help you in your time of need. If you're located outside the U.S., of course, call your local emergency line immediately. Yes. Well, for the title of our episode today, The Tempest of Trauma, today we will be discussing, obviously, right, what is trauma and go into further detail regarding that. But before we do that, we want to review last week's episode. Well, I say last week, but it wasn't quite last week. (laughs) Um, Our previous episode, I should say which was on a biblical case study regarding core beliefs. Now, Katie, can you give us just a brief summary? What exactly was that biblical case study on? Yeah, so we studied um, the story of Mephibosheth, and it was a beautiful study, so profound on the healing power of, yes, of course, God and God instilling in us value, uh, but also the power the healing power of relationships. So through Mephibosheth's interactions with David, King David, he was able to heal his core beliefs that maybe we even emphasize that his situation didn't change, right? He still had physical limitations and and a disability, but yet his mind changed, his core beliefs changed, the roots of his tree. And so I would just encourage you, if you haven't yet watched it, to watch it. And to me, I loved it because it also just encourages us to read the Bible in a light that we haven't seen before in a very practical, practical light for our mental health. Yes. And so someone may be thinking, okay, we've been talking about core beliefs, right? How is that connecting with this next subject matter in regards to trauma? So what Mm -hmm. would you say in response to that, Katie? I would say um, to hold on to that question. (laughs) Uh, we'll (laughs) review kind of the homework from last time and then we'll review core beliefs um we'll pray and then we'll review core beliefs and um, that would be a nice segue into the tempest of trauma so a little bit about the application so at the end of every episode we have an application because we know the application is needed for transformation um so we wanted you to reflect on if you're mephibosheth if you struggle with your um self value and worth and you identify negative core beliefs allow God to change your belief through the people and experiences he gives you right so Mephibosheth Mm -hmm. could have you know not he could have rejected David's help but received that Uh, now if you are King David maybe God wants you to seek out those who are struggling with their core beliefs and allow God to use you to bring healing to whomever may be in your life that might be those Mephibosheths and so um if you notice that both of them, right, sometimes it could be different seasons of your life, but both require intentionality in either receiving healing or being the contributor or the um, conduit to, uh, to healing. So we encourage you to please watch that episode and incorporate these things in your life because they can have a profound impact on you and those around you. Yes, yes. And so if you haven't watched that episode, Please do so. And it is a segue into our current episode, right, Katie? Yeah. Okay. So are we ready to answer that question? Yes, we can pray and then we'll answer. (laughs) Okay. Why don't we go ahead and bow our heads in prayer? Dear God in heaven, Lord, we come before you at this moment 
asking for guidance, asking Lord for, for understanding on a subject matter that oftentimes seems so confusing that we don't understand. And that's in regards to trauma. Lord, we pray that you touch the lives of those who are watching who have experienced trauma, Lord. Um, and if we are not aware of the trauma we've experienced, I pray that you bring that awareness, Lord, so we can experience transformation and healing. Thank you for all you do for us, especially for hearing this prayer. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the tempest of trauma. Now, if you know you didn't watch our previous episodes on core beliefs or you need a little refresher, pause the video now or pause the audio and go back to that. Um, because we're going to be briefly reviewing and specifically using this image that we've used before. Um, now, it could seem a little complicated, so I'll briefly review it and then talk about how trauma fits into this picture here. So if you all remember, we started off our series with talking about the triangle of behavior, thoughts, and emotions or feelings. And we talked about how they're all connected. So these are the tree branches, right, of our trees. And we start off by trimming the branches or plucking the fruit, right? Making changes, um, especially with behavior. So we start feeling better. We start thinking more clearly and we change our thoughts and so forth. But what happens is these tree branches can grow back, right? And they typically do if we don't then address the roots. And so we talked about for the roots, um, our core beliefs, how we view ourselves, how we view others, how we view the world, how we view God, um, then impacts our tree branches and our fruits. But it doesn't stop there, right? So well, where do our core beliefs come from? Our core beliefs come from our home environment, typically our childhoods. And so with that, with our childhood, different experiences um, that then start to shape how we view ourselves and others and so forth. Now, we talked briefly, we use this image more so to talk about maintenance, right? As you start, built, you know, basically planting your new tree, you want to make sure that you have ongoing habits, right? Exercise and sleep and so forth that continues to maintain a healthy soil. Um, we talked about having a home environment. Now, as a child, you couldn't choose your environment, but now you can make sure to surround yourself with healthy people who have healthy trees, coping skills, right? Like thought records or other things that you can continue to use um, to refine and to make sure that your tree's okay. And then we talked briefly about current circumstances, right? The weather in which we have no control over. And sometimes, you know, like here in California, it is way too hot and that heat can really kill plants. Sometimes in some areas, there could be way too much rain. That's not so common these days, but there could be circumstances or maybe a downpour after a drought in which can also ruin your tree, right? Or, or can seem like it can ruin your tree. And oftentimes, you know, sometimes we think about this as just circumstances like, oh, I got fired or other things. Um, and they can, you know, cause some damage. But overall, you know, we say we can't control those things, right? So, you know, we just ignore the weather, right? Um, but today, in our topic of the tempest of trauma, we want to talk about the thunderstorms in our lives. You want to talk about the storms which come in and, and maybe you, these storms have resulted in, um, have occurred in your childhood, which then actually damaged your soil, right? Or maybe you've had good soil and then later on in life, you had a, a storm that then really disrupted your, your soil, or maybe you're going through one now. What you notice about weather is that it will always be there, right? Uh, there's no perfect weather. People move to California thinking it's perfect weather. There's no place on earth which is perfect weather all the time. Some people might say, oh, Hawaii or other places, but there's still thunderstorms. There's still storms and we can't control. We can't not, we cannot not have uh, trauma mm -hmm. in our lives. So the question then becomes, how do we deal with that trauma? Now, specifically today is, today's episode, we want to focus on, we've talked a lot about core beliefs, but trauma is one of the most contributing factors of shaping those core beliefs. And so it's kind of like the root to the root. Mm -hmm. So some people try to change their core beliefs, but they haven't fully resolved their past trauma. So yes, we talked about 
okay, you need to deal with your core beliefs and that's long, that deals with long lasting change. And we talked about how, if you remember this, Chris, we're like, you know, there's many clients that we have that they just stop at trimming the branches and then they come back to therapy or they, you know, don't have long lasting change because they didn't deal with their core beliefs. Mm -hmm. Well, the same we could say is some people can deal with their core beliefs, but if they never dealt with their trauma, the Mm -hmm. soil, it's almost as if you could choose healthier relationships and so forth, try to choose your soil or change it. But if you still have lingering trauma, then your soil is still not completely healthy as well as another storm can come back and just bring up the same soil from before. And so I don't know, Crystal, do you want to share a little bit about maybe if you've had experiences with clients that you realize like, oh, maybe we've worked on things, but then like trauma came up as kind of that deeper layer that then really feeds those core beliefs. Yes. And so as you were saying, right, you could have worked on your core beliefs. However, if trauma itself has not been resolved as it presently affects you, your core beliefs are going to continually paint what you experience in your trauma. So for example, one that I've heard more recently is in regards to going through different traumatic events and then shaping that core belief into the world is unsafe or people are not trustworthy. And so when they go to their job, when they're in their marriage, when they're even the relationship between them and their children is compromised because of the fact that that core belief continues to to play because the trauma itself has not been resolved or processed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's so significant to be able to first recognize that trauma has happened and also to recognize how it has contributed and shaped Mm -hmm. your core beliefs. Because once you notice what that is, that connection, then you can begin to take action to change things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I've had even clients who say this, they say, you know, intellectually, I know Mm -hmm that my core belief is wrong. Like we've challenged it. We've really worked through it, but they're like, in my heart, I still feel it should be true. And often what's underlying that is unresolved, unprocessed and work through trauma. So we'll be utilizing kind of this analogy throughout today's Mm -hmm. episode. So just kind of take a mental picture of it. And then I'm going to unshare the screen, but then we'll come back to it um, later. But again, we're talking about the tempest of trauma. Yes. And just to recognize, right, trauma is a shared experience. It's something that many of us have experienced. And so if you're watching this episode, you've either personally experienced it, right? You will experience a trauma, you've witnessed it, or you will help someone with their trauma. And so Mm -hmm. this episode is for all of us. Yes, yes, very true. So, Chriselle, let's maybe start with what is trauma? Um, Because I I think when I often do um, a lot of trauma presentations, if I don't clearly define it, people are like, well, what really, what's considered as trauma? Because I've I've been through this and I've been through that. So what is trauma? We'll maybe start with the definition, but then kind of explain or expound upon Mm -hmm. it a little bit more. Okay, well, trauma, according to the American Psychological Association, is considered an emotional response to a terrible event, such as an accident, a rape, or even a natural disaster. It's immediately after the event that shock and denial are typical. Longer term reactions include unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationships, and even physical symptoms, such as headaches or nausea or continual tension in the body. There's a lot, there's a long list of all of that, but that would be the definition according to the American Psychological Association. Now, the question is, right, Katie, does that fully encompass and explain what trauma is, that definition? Yeah, one thing I want to highlight first off is, you know, it's an emotional response. And that's really key because sometimes when we're trying to define trauma, we focus so much on the event itself. Oh, Mm -hmm. does is the event itself, does it qualify to be traumatic or not? But a key element of trauma is the subjective uh, reality of trauma, right? There, it's an emotional response to a terrible event. Now, just because somebody view, someone may view everything traumatic, so there is an element of uh, objectivity when it comes to terrible events. Mm-hmm. But what then is defined as a terrible event? 
So what's problematic about this definition, there's several things and some people might be thinking, wow, are you arguing against the American Psychological Association? <laughs> um, not at all. Well, to some degree, Somewhat. yes, I guess. <laughs> yes. Um, but just to be able to better um, to better capture um, what trauma really is. So uh, one of the things that I see that's problematic about this definition is it focuses on an event. Mm -hmm. And this is not just my argument. Um, there's a lot of in the research about complex PTSD that the diagnosis in the DSM about PTSD is too limited. It only focuses on an event very much so like acute situation. So it's kind of like one time thunderstorm. But as we know, there could be multiple thunderstorms and that really can have a chronic um, impact on an individual, especially when it comes to core beliefs. And so PTSD is often in that focus, but trauma in general, we have to really look at it, not just from an event, right? It's a terrible event, but really look at it from a complex, chronic um, viewpoint. Um, and it's not just focusing later on in life. Um, so oftentimes PTSD focuses on like, oh, something that happens to you later on. But think about childhood. If things are happening ongoing, that complexity and that how it's chronic can really shape, right? We're talking about that soil again. And then that soil leads to core belief. So it's not just an event. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there's more, right? In terms of what's problematic about this definition mm -hmm. is that typically when it comes to asking someone, have you been through trauma? And even with this definition itself is regarding an event, right? Versus the well, fact a terrible that event. Yes, a terrible event. Yes, let me specify that. <laughs> a terrible event. Rather than also recognizing that trauma can also be the absence of good, right? Mm -hmm. Now, someone would be asking, what do you mean the absence of good? So, okay, can you give an example of how trauma could be the absence of good? Yeah, so in trauma research, sometimes what they allude to or how they categorize this is type A versus type B. Type B mm -hmm. is something bad happening, right? Like sexual abuse, right? We definitely mm -hmm. would categorize that as terrible. But then type A is the absence of good, for example, emotional neglect. So a child not receiving love, not receiving, if you think about a tree, it could either be a thunderstorm of, of bad things, right? Or it could be a lack of nutrients. You're not feeding. So not just maybe a downpour of rain, it could also be a drought where there's not enough rain. And both can have a negative impact on your tree and on your roots. And then that adds in, right, that focusing on typical events versus atypical events. Yeah, good, good. What do you mean by typical and atypical? So typical, like, for example, when I do assessments and I ask someone, have you been through trauma? I haven't been through rape or I haven't, um, I haven't been in war. I haven't had any sexual abuse. I haven't had physical abuse. No, I haven't had any trauma. Whereas atypical would be such an example would be having a critical father. Um, mm -hmm. being raised in a home where you felt emotionally detached from your mother. Um, mm -hmm. Emotions were not expressed in your family. And so you felt as though you didn't have a place to be vulnerable and to fully express how you felt. And mm -hmm. so all of that impacts your adulthood. I work with so yeah. many adults where I ask, how do you feel about that? And the question, the answer is, well, I think this, this, this. They have no understanding mm -hmm. of how they feel because it came from a home where that wasn't provided in terms of nutrients towards emotions and understanding them and expressing yourself. Mm -hmm. So really what we're getting at so far is trauma, um, the, the, how terrible something is. As clinicians, when we see the effects of it, there are many more things that are considered um, mm -hmm. under this umbrella of trauma um, than what we typically um, define trauma as to include. And especially, Crystal, I think this is so helpful because I think a lot of people may present with certain symptoms or conditions, but then they're like, well, I shouldn't have this. And they, they kind of, they invalidate themselves because like, oh, well, I didn't go through, you know, a traumatic accident or I didn't go through a, a traumatic sexual assault, but they could still have endured trauma. And so I hope that this is in some ways encouraging people to realize that they, the way that they're suffering today, there's a reason, right? Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes 
it's kind of like we talk about with grief, there's um, ambiguous losses where we think of, oh, you, you lost a family member. Oh, that's death. Of course, that's grief. Mm -hmm. But then what about Alzheimer's, right? When they're not physically dead, but you're losing the person. So these are kind of ambiguous traumas that people are not identifying. And if you don't identify it as trauma, then you're invalidating your own experience and minimizing your own experience. Yes. You know, just one I'll throw out there that I've noticed with my patients is when women become mothers and there's that loss of independence. And it's like, my life is now surrendered to this child and they don't realize that they've gone or they're going through the process of grief and loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or then they have, you know, the empty nest syndrome and then they have another mm -hmm. loss. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Now, the last point of what's problematic about this definition is that it primarily focuses on symptoms, right? So then, oh, then this is what happens afterwards, but it doesn't focus on the deeper roots, core beliefs, right? You don't go to therapy and say, okay, let me do an assessment. Let me see. Um, you ask about the symptoms. You don't ask about, oh, okay, how did this impact your and shape the way that you view yourself or the world? Mm -hmm. So instead, if you think about that definition, the way that we could you know, include a, a more comprehensive and accurate definition is that trauma, it can be an event or it can be a series of events, right? Mm -hmm. It's not only when bad things happen, it's also the absence of good. Mm -hmm. And then it includes many types of events, typical and atypical. And then trauma shapes us and changes us to our core, not just simple mere symptoms, but shapes us to our core. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that happens, right? How trauma shapes us and changes us to our core, right? Now, I, Katie, as a therapist, right? I'm aware of trauma, right? You're aware of trauma, but oftentimes, I don't know if you've experienced this in your office, but when trauma is brought up, there sometimes is an avoidance. There's a resistance. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's like, do we have to get into that? Or, oh, mm -hmm. by the way, yeah, this happened to me too. And it's almost as though they minimize it as well. And mm -hmm. so the question is, why is it that even though it's so common, super common, mm -hmm. right? Super. We don't talk about trauma. Mm -hmm. Like Why? Yeah. So there's a, a book called Trauma and Recovery by Dr. Judith Herman that has, her, the first chapter is on the forgotten history. And mm -hmm. she outlines beautifully all the reasons why we don't talk tra about trauma, both individually and socially as a society. Why don't we talk about trauma? And in, even I would say, even within our own field. So as mental health professionals, unfortunately, a lot of people are being diagnosed with other diagnoses without actually identifying the underlying trauma and then treating the underlying trauma. Mm, so so one reason um, is Think about how terrible trauma is. We don't want to face it. We don't want to face the reality. If somebody says, you know, I was sexually assaulted, like we don't want to live in a world that that's a reality that that produces a lot of fear and me. So I don't want to hear when people are going through that. I don't want to face the reality of human vulnerability for one, because somebody says I've been sexually assaulted that poses, wow, humans are vulnerable. But then it also makes forces us to face the reality of the capacity for evil in, in human nature, right? Mm -hmm. So it's often from the victim's perspective of human vulnerability to the perpetrators of, wow, you know, someone's capable of doing that. So we don't want to face the reality that mm -hmm. trauma basically throws in our face. And so we just don't want to talk about it. If I don't talk about it, if I don't talk about how many people are dying from cancer, I don't want to talk about how many people are raped every you know second so then I don't want to talk about it so then I don't have to live with that reality that it poses it's true and that's I think another reason often, mm -hmm. I think oftentimes as well as when someone comes and they may disclose their trauma um, there's that fear that the other person may not understand the other person will invalidate the other person may mm -hmm. blame me and yes. then oftentimes, if you're not the person who's experienced the trauma, but you may be the other party, you don't want to have the person open up because it's like that burden of, do I have to resolve this? How do I solve this? Like, mm -hmm. I might, or what you if helpless. this, yeah, you feel helpless or they bring up their trauma. Oh, does that 
do I share my trauma? And it's like, I don't want to share that with them. I'm not ready to share that. And so there's just this dynamic when it comes Mm -hmm. to trauma and opening up and being vulnerable about this topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we've outlined so far, we don't talk about it because it just makes us face a very horrible reality. Mm -hmm. And then what you are describing, Chrisal, is um, it also makes us feel uncomfortable. We don't know what to do with it. Even some clinicians don't know what to do with it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, even sometimes I think when we hear about trauma, it can be awkward because it would kind of be what you're describing, what to do with it is sometimes we are stuck between, do I believe the victim or the perpetrator, right? There's news of something happened and you're like, wait, do I believe, especially now this is not where I stand, but it can be a dilemma of, um, not believing the woman, right? Oh, you know, the woman just crying wolf. Or now the opposite, the pendulum has kind of swung and it's like, always believe the woman, right? Mm -hmm. So it really puts us in a difficult spot of like, how do I know the truth? Like what really happened? Mm -hmm. Um, And then sometimes, you know, it, it just, I would say it disrupts our veil of oblivion of like, Mm -hmm. we have to realize, and this one's kind of related to the first one is we like to live in this oblivious state where this in this world that trauma doesn't happen but when you really go back to the statistics it is a shared human experience yeah and it can be scary to hear the Mm -hmm. stories of trauma from others because it's like Mm -hmm. will that happen to me can that happen to me Mm -hmm. yeah right now i'm i'm teaching a trauma course um, at a university and i have to have a conversation with my students like, mm-hmm. hey, let's just pause for a second. Cause I was like, I realize that when you start reading so much about trauma and you start having seen clients that you yourself, it's called vicarious traumatization mm-hmm. where then you're traumatized. And some of my students were like, yes, like I'm starting to scan the streets more and I'm looking at this person. I'm looking, and mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'm so glad that I brought it up because it does yeah. then heighten our fear response in the way that, well, what if it could happen to me? But one of the ways, one of the main reasons why we don't talk about trauma is that it disrupts our fundamental beliefs, Mm. our key beliefs about how the world functions, the key beliefs about the way God functions. If we say, oh, God, you know, is a, a good God and he protects us from everything, then all of a sudden, whoa, how do I deal with my, my loved one dying? Like I, I, or if I say bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people, then all of a sudden it happens to me. Does that make me a bad person? It shakes our world and how we perceived our world and how we per- perceived ourselves. Yes, it shakes it. And to add to that, oftentimes it opens up the, the door to have to begin to try to find an understanding of why. Mm, yes. Why? has this happened and why me why god i mean that question why can be placed in in front of many different questions right um but and oftentimes we're like i don't have the answer to that so i'm not going to even entertain that i don't want to open that door because to be left with no answers is that much more even traumatic Mm -hmm. because i can't assimilate and understand what's going on Mm -hmm. Yeah, Grisel, and that's such a key part of why we don't talk about trauma, right? Because why would you talk about a question that there's no answer to, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, we need resolution as human beings. We like, you know, to have answers and answers provide us a sense of security and safety. Mm -hmm. And so trauma automatically, when I worked in a hospital setting with palliative care patients, always, why? right? Why me? Why God? Why is this happening? Why does this happen to other people? Why is this happening to my family member? You know, why was I assaulted? Why was there a natural disaster? Why, 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 why? And we don't have very good answers. We as in human beings, Mm -hmm. although the Bible has very good answers, but even we don't read sometimes the Bible correctly, or we don't um, interpret, or we just kind of, we only cherry pick certain verses, Mm -hmm. but we don't realize that God is wanting to answer the why question for us. Mm -hmm. So 
what's important in terms of trauma in order to begin the healing process? I mean, for one, we just, we need to start talking about it. We need to talk about it um, mm-hmm. on an individual level. Meaning if you're, you've experienced trauma, you need to go and, and talk with a professional or um, even through the sense of community. We need to talk about it as a society, right? We need to talk about it as a church community. And it's so interesting because the Bible talks about it all the time. So it's modeling to us that the more and more that we I see it as a problem and as a reality, the more and more we can talk about it and the more and more that we can heal from it. Yes. And so I just like to make a point. Oftentimes we think that in order to heal trauma is simply just to talk about it. And that's mm-hmm. not just the only step. It's the that's beginning the of the step. Yes. Mm-hmm. Of being vulnerable and being, you know, insistent on trying to find and seek healing. But I'm saying that Katie, because sometimes there's that mentality that when you go seek mental health advice or guidance, mm-hmm. when it comes to trauma is I talked about it. Mm-hmm. That's not, that's not just what needs to be done. And that's where we bring on how we can go through our trauma understand the trauma we're going to go through this the rest of the episode and how we can change how our trauma is presently impacting us today yeah so the reason why talking about trauma both from an individual and then societal level is important is because one of the key um, key behaviors and key symptoms or, or results of trauma is avoidance avoidance so our, our knee jerk reaction is not to talk about it, right? The shame of it, the, um, the, the pain of it, we just want to hide, right? We want to just isolate. So we need to talk about it, which we're doing now, but also mm-hmm. you need to talk about it. But Chris, all you're spot on that that's the first step, but a lot mm-hmm. of people just stay there. And by just talking about it without actually finding resolution, we'll talk about why talking about it's not enough. Um, but we definitely need to to talk as the first step. Now, the analogy I like to give for that is um, if we break a bone, right? If we avoid it, so I broke my wrist, you remember this, Chriselle? Um, yes. And it looked a little bit like this, right? Mm-hmm. If I ignored it, right? Avoidance, don't want to talk about it, want to isolate, you know, oh, and if I'll just ignore it and it'll just go away. Time heals all wounds, false, okay? So what happens, Chriselle, if I don't go to the doctor? Does oh, it heal? Yeah. Well, it will heal that way. However, mm-hmm. it will it won't heal back in place. Yeah, so it'll heal, but mm-hmm. over time, what happens is that it has like this, not a super like strong pain, maybe, but it's there, and then it gets worse and worse, and eventually, till what happens, Chrisal? In terms of your wrist. Yeah, what happens? Do do I want to live like this for the rest of my life with all this no, pain? Cause it, no, because no. No, because right. you will be constantly reminded that it's not healed correctly. Mm-hmm. And so with the trauma, if you avoid it, you avoid it, avoid it, it won't go away, right? The soil, the damage has been done. You need to, like if this was a pot, you need to repot, you need to, you know, do some changes. What you need to do is you need to go to the hospital, right? You go to your doctor and then what do they do, Chriselle? They set it back in place. And I remember when they, they did that for you. They break it. <laughs> They rebreak it, which I tell people, you know, dressing your trauma actually hurts. It might get worse it before it gets better, but yeah. then you're able to then start the healing process. So the first step is talking, addressing what, addressing the trauma, um, to talk about it. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about it. Are we ready to talk about it? <laughs> yes. Yes. So, Chriselle, let's talk about it this way. So a lot of times we avoid trauma because of the fear of the event itself or the events, right? But what is actually problematic about the trauma? Like, What actually shapes core beliefs? Is it really just the trauma itself, the event itself? Not necessarily. It's the way that we go about interpreting what mm-hmm. happened. It's not just the event itself. Yes. yes, the events influence, they play a role, mm-hmm. but they're, they're not isolated. Yeah. And the way that I explain that to my patients is, if you think about it, the trauma already happened. Mm-hmm. 
is just a memory, right? It, it happened a long time ago. You're not actually in danger anymore. If you were sexually assaulted, you were sexually assaulted before. Why are you still afraid of it? Mm -hmm. You're still afraid because of the interpretation. So for example, if you have the interpretation or core belief, men are all, you know, untrustworthy or uh, will Cheers. hurt me, mm -hmm. then that's how sexual assault is that memory is disturbing because you're thinking you're still in danger. Mm -hmm. But if you really think about it, it's like, no, right. That happened a long time ago and it was horrible when it happened, but I'm no longer in danger. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, you're spot on Crystal. It's the interpretations. Mm -hmm. It's how it shapes our core beliefs that then result in ongoing difficulties. Yes. And so this is where we're going to, bring up a psychological concept that helps understand mm -hmm. how this actually happens. And so that's the schema theory, right? So essentially, what is the schema theory? What it talks about is that we as individuals, right? We construct schemas or what we call abstract cognitive representations of reality, which then are encoded in our memory and then recalled as needed to explain and predict life events. So that sounds a little complicated. Katie, let's make that a little more, more practical. <laughs> what does that look like in terms of applying that to someone's experience of trauma? Yeah, so you said schemas, right? That we build schemas, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and you said cognitive representations of reality. So basically mm -hmm. our mind is trying to interpret reality. So we create schemas, ideas, right? Beliefs. Um, and then you said encoded in memory, so then it's like, okay, so let me, let me give an example. That's mm -hmm. probably easiest. So you and you're little, right. You're starting to build these schemas. You might have this belief of, oh, um, an object in the sky is a bird, right? You have built a schema of a of, of belief. Okay. Things in the air that fly bird. And so it's encoded in memory and then recalled as needed to explain and predict life events. So then the next time you see as a child, something flying in the sky, you say bird, right? You're trying to predict life events. Okay, bird is in the sky. Now, these models are intricately networked to provide coherent, comprehensive structures of meaning. So it starts helping you, you know, understand the world. Um, and they, yeah, they help you manage everyday life, right? Um, but with trauma specifically, um, what happens is that trauma can start disrupting, can, can really challenge that schema, right? So mm -hmm. this is not a trauma, but this is an example of how, okay, birds, you know, are in the sky. And then a child sees an airplane. And what does the child say? Bird, bird. Bird, <laughs> right? Because mm -hmm. it has that schema of things in the sky, objects in the sky that fly, bird, right? Mm -hmm. But then something happens. Now, this case is not traumatic, but something happens. And so what does a child need to do, Chriselle, in order to build a healthy schema? Be able to understand that not everything in the sky is the bird, right? They have to accommodate that mm -hmm. schema to mm -hmm. then be flexible and understand that not everything in the sky is a bird. You could have a bird and there could be an airplane. Mm -hmm. So you need to change your schema mm -hmm. in order to incorporate new information, right? Mm -hmm. So we call that process accommodation, what you just mentioned, yes. right? So you change the schema in order to accommodate for new information. That's a healthy way of forming schemas, which then help you interpret and manage everyday life. Mm -hmm. Now, let's give maybe a trauma example. A trauma example might be you have a belief you know, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, right? We call it the just world theory or hypothesis, mm -hmm. right? It's a just world, it's a clean world. Mm -hmm. But then let's say you are, you know, you're in a tragic accident, car accident, you almost die. A bad thing happened to me. So what are some options? How could I respond? In, in regards to my schema what would be an unhealthy way of responding what would be a healthy way an unhealthy way of or a healthy way of responding is recognizing that accidents can happen to anyone 
Mm -hmm. This time around, it happened to you and it was unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Okay. Then so what would we need to do? So my schema says good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Mm -hmm. Now that's the airplane in the sky. It doesn't fit my schema. So what, what would be the healthy response in that example? I need to change my schema, right? Okay. I'm like, I feel like she's seeking an answer. So I just answer. So <laughs> accommodate, taking in that new information. So I need to change to say, hmm, bad things happen to bad people, good things to good people. No, bad things could happen to good people too, right? Yeah. But oftentimes, in order to, to maintain our schema, we instead either over accommodate or assimilate. So as, what would be assimilation, Crystal? Um, when we take the traumatic event and we interpret, we interpret it in a way that fits our current existing schema. So if we're thinking the world is unsafe, well, the schema that you take in terms of that event is to add on to that schema. Mm -hmm. So in this example, so you're, you're holding onto the schema, but changing the, the, the interpretation of the event. In this case, the interpretation would be, oh, I must have done something wrong. Right. Because mm -hmm. or, or no, or I am bad. That bad, bad thing happened to me. Therefore, I am bad. So I hold on to that schema and I assimilated the new information into that that schema. Right. Now, over accommodation, what's over accommodation? You do change your schema, but you change it in a dysfunctional, inaccurate way. OK, so the example for that in this situation would be the world is a dangerous place, right? Mm -hmm. And so you start thinking that eh, bad or good, everybody's going to be in car accident. So I don't want to go out and I don't want to drive. And right. So you see how assimilated or over accommodated versus you just change your schema, right? Mm -hmm. Accommodation, healthy accommodation. I hope I'm not losing anyone. Um, is there anything, Chriselle, that you think would be helpful for us to clarify in regards to schemas? I don't think so. I think just to add on, right, is how does trauma happen in a way that shapes our schemas is just recognizing that when trauma happens, mm -hmm. we create meaning, which then can lead to many different questions. Why did this happen? Like you were saying you know, through your example, is this God punishing me? Is there something I mm -hmm. did something wrong with me? And then the mm -hmm. answers to these questions many times inaccurate, right? They mm -hmm. then lead to challenging prior schemas, developing and or alternating the inaccurate mm -hmm. schemas, which are not always entirely conscious to us. So some of us are, may not even be fully aware mm -hmm. of what's going on internally um, or conceptually core beliefs if they persist in terms of altering and developing. Mm -hmm. core yeah. Beliefs. So maybe to give some other examples, let's say if you have, you know, a belief that the world is safe, right? And that you are safe in this world. And then you you know, you're, you're physically abused or you're sexually abused, right? It could result in a, an over belief of like, let's say if it happened from a, a male, men are untrustworthy, right? Men are mm -hmm. dirty, men are, and then that shapes how you then, your relationships, that shapes your behaviors and your anxiety around men and so forth. Um, or, one of the things I see the most, it's so fascinating um, when it comes to sexual abuse is self-blame. That's a assimilated version of schemas is they're like, oh, they don't blame the perpetrator, which you would think, oh, you know, almost over accommodated seems more plausible. You think, oh, yeah, I can see you're trying to protect yourself by saying all men are this way. But many don't jump to that conclusion. They then say, well, I was a perfect candidate or I didn't fight him off, or I didn't do this. And that doesn't fit the reality of the trauma. You were a three-year-old, you were a four-year-old. How, how could you have done that? But they're trying to make sense. How did this happen? Oh, I must have been to blame. It must have been me. So we're trying to make sense of trauma, but trauma creates such a crisis and confusion in our brains that we try to make sense. And so sometimes you would, this is a, a key point. It is sometimes scarier to accept the reality of the actual truth 
that yes, we are vulnerable to danger, then, so it's scary to, to accept that, then to self-blame. I would rather live with the blame because then it's just, I'm just the problem versus the things around me. But mm-hmm. what's so scary, what causes so much distress and PTSD symptoms and so forth, is if you really think about if you are to blame, remember we said it's not the trauma itself, it's the interpretation, then you are the perpetrator then you are walking around with yourself wherever you go and you are always in danger. Wow. Wow. So we see, right? Trauma can definitely happen in a way that shapes our schemas mm-hmm. or alters them, etc. challenges yeah. them, etc. right? Mm-hmm. So the question yeah. then, oh, go ahead. I was just going to give one more example because we we've talked a little bit more about typical, right? I want to talk about atypical or or the type A of, let's say, emotional neglect. And Crystal, if you have an example too, feel free to chime in. But think about how could emotional neglect result in an over-accommodated or assimilated belief? Well, I've heard oftentimes when individuals have said, oh, I'm just super sensitive. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and so the problem is me and my marriage. If I'm mm-hmm. not as sensitive, then mm-hmm. I wouldn't be as triggered and we wouldn't have conflict. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an assimilated belief, right? Mm-hmm. The other one that mm-hmm. I thought you were going to go this route. Um, oh. <laughs> so when you're talking, no, 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 it was, it was a great example. It just, I was like, oh, and then it's kind of split in two different directions mm-hmm. is if they're, they're experiencing emotional neglect, then they say, oh, I'm unlovable, right? So if my parents never told me uh, I love you, the child then interprets I'm unlovable, right? So that's a simulated um, version. Now, some people, I've had clients who the over-accommodated might be, oh, um, people are are evil, right? People can't love me. So it's not about me, or sometimes it's a combination of both. But what would be an example in that case, Crystal, of accommodated? How, how do we make sense of the emotional neglect in a way that is truthful? Well, really quickly, another, another example of over-accommodating is even generalizing when it comes to emotions, right? Emotions are not to be expressed. Emotions are for those who are weak. To express yeah. is a form of weakness. And that translates into the dynamic of the relationships altogether. And even mm-hmm. with your relationship to yourself in terms of denying your emotions or accepting them and processing them. So that's yeah. just another brief example. But yeah. you were saying another example of accommodation, right? Yeah. In in that example, what would be a healthy accommodating belief? That if I'm unlovable or people are evil. Well, I came from a home where my mother struggled because she came from a home, mm-hmm. generational trauma. Mm-hmm. My mom isn't necessarily that she doesn't love me, but she did, was not equipped to know what love is and how to express mm-hmm. it. So what you're doing is you're going back to the details of the trauma mm-hmm. and looking at what is the truth, what actually happened. What right? actually happened. So, Crystal, we're already starting to answer, how do you, we heal from trauma? Well, we, we talk about it. And then? Talk about it, right? We need to accurately change our schemas which is first being aware of what they are right and Mm -hmm. then how do we change that accommodation accommodation is the goal but then how do we achieve accommodation it's like these these layers is as you were saying katie going and seeking the truth what is the truth in terms of what happened in that trauma and being able to highlight that right um and Katie, the most beautiful part, right, is where is the truth found? Mm-hmm. Where, are where truth is the truth found? <laughs> yes, right. Um, and so, yes, the Bible has answers to that why. And some of you may be like, huh, really? I've read the Bible. I don't really know what you're talking about because I haven't quite seen anything to answer that question why for me and what happened mm-hmm. to me. Um, And so for the sake of time, (laughs) we're going to put you here um, on a cliffhanger in terms of not answering that question. We're going to address that in our next episode. Um, But before we do, we do want to just highlight that that is true. The Bible has truth. 
And what does the Bible have to say in terms of trauma? And so we want to highlight specifically recognizing that there is a paradoxical element of trauma. And there are biblical passages and verses that go into understanding how while things may happen to us, it doesn't always have to necessarily be negative, if that's mm-hmm. rightly said, Katie. How how yeah. would you? So let me just kind of pause for a second because I don't want to jump too far ahead. Um, so a part of healing from trauma is recognizing the mm-hmm. post-traumatic growth and the blessings that come out of it. But I want to pause for a second because I think if we rush too quickly, it can be we're not recognizing the steps we need to take. So when we say let we need to talk about trauma, step one. Mm-hmm. So from a therapy side, what we would have people do is actually write the trauma. There's research studies that show that people can even just write their trauma for sessions. All they do, they come to the session and they just write. They don't even talk to the therapist and that's already healing for them. So mm-hmm. you can talk about it or write about it and specifically bringing that before God. God is your ultimate therapist. We've talked about him as the truth prescriber. So write about your trauma, right? Start expressing it, start getting, you know, getting it out, um, allowing yourself to, to heal, process it. And then, Crystal, you said, then we need to have an accurate change of our schemas, right? Accommodation. And you mentioned that only through truth. Mm-hmm. As we write the trauma, we can also go back to the details of that trauma and then make sense of, what actually happened, not the schema that I created or over accommodated or assimilated, changed, changed the details of the trauma to meet the tr- what happened, but what it what actually happened. So one way, and this is why I wanted to pause for a second, that we what we do in therapy is we have people write out an impact statement. Why do you think the trauma happened? And when you write down why, oh, it was my fault, it was that's where often these incorrect schemas come out. So if you want to really work through your trauma, write about it, talk about it, then write, why do you think it happened? And often what happens is what we call stuck points of beliefs that you have about the trauma that are not correct, come out. Mm -hmm. And then you can challenge those stuck points. You can challenge those beliefs to go back to the trauma. So if you say, I am to blame, go back to the trauma. No, I was four years old. I'm not to blame, right? Or if I have the belief, all, all men are untrustworthy. Is that true? No, it's just that person. Now there might be other people as well, but it's not just all men, right? And so talk about it, write about the trauma, then write why you think it happened to bring out maybe some of those stuck points or incorrect schemas. And then utilize you know, the Bible, a therapist or God kind of formed also that ability to have truth. They kind of have that perspective, outside perspective, but using, using the Bible to really challenge those incorrect schemas. Mm. Then now, Chris, we can kind of briefly go into, and we don't have time to go into, as you mentioned, all of it, but another way to heal from trauma is instead of fearing the trauma, seeing that the trauma itself can result in what we call post-traumatic growth. That even, as you mentioned, paradoxical blessings, right? Mm -hmm. Seems like, how how could that be? And yet there could be blessings that come out of it. And so just to briefly highlight, right? Benefits that can occur from, in terms of speaking of that post-traumatic growth is increasing appreciation for those elements of life, which may have once been considered ordinary And perhaps even we took it for granted. Um, And they can even add on to, as they say, like a spiritual transcendence. Um, I've heard people say, well, you know, after I went through my trauma, I talked about it. I processed it. I, my relationship with God improved. I I grew Mm -hmm. and, and not only was I able to grow, but I was also able to help others as well. And so furthermore, right. There are two processes that can happen in terms of benefits accrued from having experienced trauma the two are called adaptive rumination and then secondly cognitive flexibility so adaptive rumination is where um, the individual is allowed to reconsider the assumptions of previously held schemas and then rebuild new more comprehensive more resilient schemas Um, as you mentioned katie with the whole 
analogy with a bone, right? It's just, it may be distressing. It may be painful. It may be hard, but still it's necessary. And it's necessary following the process of trauma. You want that to heal back accurately. And so, yes, you don't want to go through that pain again, but it's necessary. Um, so adaptive rumination and then cognitive flexibility is just your ability to to assess for the possibility of alternative solutions when you're problem solving and also to test various solutions as well. And so essentially your mind becomes that much more flexible to switch the cognitive schemas that you've developed over time. Yeah. So I like that, Chriselle, because if you think about what the steps I was just talking about, the process of actually challenging your trauma, right? The way that you view the trauma actually then rewires your brain in ability to then also better, right, when the adaptive rumination and cognitive flexibility to then better interpret future traumas because the thunderstorms will come again, right? And sometimes they are those big events, sometimes they're smaller events, but the Bible's very clear. It says, do not, you know, consider it a strange thing that you've had this fiery trial, right? It talks about, it's a very normal experience because of the world that we live in. So I love that, that part of the post-traumatic growth is, when you work through the trauma, you're able to build more resilient schemas. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that we don't like to, we, we just want to have the resilience without the difficulties, right? Now, using the tree analogy and going back to, right, the, the weather, right, the tempest um, of trauma, if you think about thunderstorms, uh, specifically lightning, they're actually good for plants. We think, oh, that's gonna, you know, trauma is gonna disrupt my life, but it's actually good. What's fascinating is the air around us is full of nitrogen, but plants are not actually able to absorb nitrogen from the air directly. So lightning and rain actually uh, put this nitrogen into the soil where plants can actually absorb it. So it's fascinating, right? So we may think that thunderstorms are not good, um, but that's why, you know, we could see lawns or gardens or, you know, landscapes look so green after a thunderstorm. Ironically, and, right? <laughs> and I can see that so much so for my clients, like mm -hmm. they grow immensely after trauma. Now, this is a side comment, something to just consider when you're looking for trauma treatment is sometimes we are so we're looking for quick, easy change. But the adaptive rumination, the cognitive flexibility, the blessings that come, the post-traumatic growth is only possible in the process, in the journey of recovery. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, if you want that quick fix, you may, you know, have certain treatments that, you know, process the trauma really quickly, but you don't actually ever learn how to change that schema. And mm -hmm. if you don't, the next trauma that happens, you're also susceptible. Now, thunderstorms may not be good for you if, you know, it's so drastic that a tree limb falls or damages your property, or, you know, it, it's such severe um, weather that it, it, yeah, it can disrupt. And so what's important is what they actually say, you need to prepare your plants for, you know, for bad weather. So you can, you know, have regular maintenance of trees and shrubs that can actually prevent a lot of the storm's damage which is fascinating, right? It's like, how do you build your resilience even with small things to then prepare you for trauma? So all too often, we only assess the damage to our trees and shrubs after storms when we should actually be inspecting them regularly to ensure they aren't damaged when severe weather does hit. Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of like a dual application here of you need to create resilience now before trauma comes, but also go back to your prior traumas think through it, build accurate schemas. So then that helps you actually then look at your traumas from a perspective of growth and healing and blessings. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I can keep on going, but I'll pause for, for now. Did you have a comment? Yeah. I was just going to say, you know, when we went over a simulation, accommodation, over accommodation, oftentimes that's a reflection of how our mind functions in that particular time frame that we experience the trauma. And so if we're talking about prevention versus intervention, right? And the power of prevention, if you are watching this and you haven't necessarily experienced trauma, um, typical, maybe atypical, and you're like, well, I'm, it's not too bad for my life right now. 
you can actively continue working on making sure, as the Bible says, to renew your mind, right? Um, and to be able to maintain healthy thoughts so that when you may hit that storm, you're mm-hmm. already engaged in prevention. You're already aware that it could happen and you're prepared. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Still, it's it, it's still gonna have an impact. Don't get me wrong. It's not like you're gonna be riding the storm. Ooh, I'm loving this. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you will be that much more prepared and be able to accept mm-hmm. the reality and be able to assimilate, not assimilate, accommodate, right? Mm-hmm. Be able to accommodate through that trauma. Yes, and it's going back to you should know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You free. To close, Crystal, um, you know, we will part of fully healing, as we talked about, is creating new schema, and part of creating new schema or making sure that they're accurate is by looking at the truth, right, and the truth in the Bible, and we need to answer some of those why questions. Why? do bad things happen, right? Even to good people. Why has it happened to me? Why God, God, are you, did, are you creating this? Are you causing this to happen? Mm-hmm. Now we will fully and more directly answer those why questions through the Bible in our next episode. We'll do a biblical case study. You can probably already guess who that's going to be on, but it's so rich. I'm looking forward to this episode. Yeah, probably I'm anticipating that's going to be one of my favorite episodes, um, but part will partly answer it to close by answering why does God allow these things to happen? And we just mentioned post-traumatic growth. Now, Crystal, you can maybe read some of your favorites, but I'll allude to some. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. There's And this doesn't specify what exactly that eternal glory is, but it's alluding to that some way, somehow that these troubles and difficulties will one day, it's going to produce something in us, going to shape us somehow Mm -hmm. in a way that it makes everything worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then James 1, 2 to 4 and 12 also then starts telling us what might that be? Consider it pure joy, Mm -hmm. count it all joy when you fall into various trials. What? Why? Because you know that these trials produces perseverance. Mm -hmm. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature. So perseverance causes patience, perseverance, but also results in maturity. We talked about resilience and growth that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Then later it says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So it's not only a maturity in the sense of, you know, life experiences. If you think about those people you talk to that are like veterans or other people, those mm-hmm. traumas have resulted in wisdom, have resulted in experience in, in, in a way that they would not be the same person without those experiences. Yes. And talking about how your experience of trauma can help others second corinthians chapter one verse three mm-hmm. praise be to the god and father of our lord jesus christ the father of compassion and the god of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from god mm-hmm. so recognizing that it's not just a blessing that we may receive but a blessing to pass on to others yes. as well i love that i just had a client the other day who um she like had no mental health history and then out of the blue and she's like, why, why, why? And then she was able to answer this. She realized that before she had like zero empathy for people with any sort of mental health difficulty. She's like, I thought they were weak. I thought, And she's like, for it to happen to me, I realized it's not whether or not you're weak or not. Mm-hmm. It could be life circumstances. It could be other things. And so she, it developed in her, in her an empathy and compassion for people in a way that she would not have learned, right? To then comfort those, right? With the same comfort that she has received. So I love that verse. Um, It also talks a little bit about God comforting us. So we're able to to draw close to God in some ways. And there's some verses that talk about how then we can also better sympathize and and connect with Jesus who suffered all things as well. Um, I love also Romans 5, three to four, basically talks about then that suffering, that trauma produces perseverance, like we talked to before, but then it adds perseverance, character, 
character and hope. So the Bible starts painting a picture. There's so many benefits to trauma, right? There's so many benefits to trials or tribulations or difficulties or troubles um, in a way that we don't fully understand, but it produces the main thing I would say summarizing is that it produces character. People who are more resilient, people who are more understanding, who are more patient, who have more compassion, both for themselves and for other people. Which then renders, Katie, having more hope that in the time that another storm may come, you're that much mm-hmm. more prepared to confront yeah. it. Yeah. And I think, Crystal, ultimately, you know, God didn't plan for trauma to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but he allows it in a way, too, that if we come together, right, that's the idea of talking about trauma, coming together, mm-hmm. we are able to support each other in a way that then makes it more bearable, that makes it not just with each other, but with God, right? That that's why he's a God of all comfort. And so instead of turning away from God, which Satan wants us to do when trauma, why God, we turn to him and we find solace, right? And instead of turning away from human beings, that's another, the, the, the tempter, his, his agenda behind trauma is to turn away from God and turn away from people. Men are untrustworthy or I am to blame. It's really hate of God and hate of others. Yes. And that's fascinating. Yes. When we realize that, then the opposite of that is we need to connect to God, connect to other people, and find healing through connection. Amen. Amen. Well, a heavy topic, but definitely all of us can relate with, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I look forward to the next episode, uh, mm-hmm. understanding specifically through a biblical story. Um, how the Bible can answer that question, why, which mm-hmm. I'm sure many of us have had to contemplate at one point in our life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So shall we pray, Crystal? Then we'll do our application. Um, yes. Okay, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord in heaven, Lord, Someone at this point may be watching this episode and have a heavy heart, Lord, maybe even in tears, the things that they have experienced. And Lord, I pray that you bring healing to that particular person. Help them to understand, Lord, that you never intended for us to suffer. However, there are circumstances in life, Lord, that are tainted with sin. And that you're so eager, Lord, to take us to a place where we will be restored where there will be no pain, no sorrow, no tears, Lord. There will be no trauma because we will be in your presence, Lord. We are eager for that day. And we ask, Lord, that you instill in all of us that hope to be able to see you face to face. Thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer and for allowing us, Lord, to talk about a difficult subject matter, Lord, that needs to be Mm -hmm. talked about. But not in the context of woe me, but Lord, Glory to you because we know that you are able to bring the healing that we need in spite of the Mm -hmm. sinful nature that we find ourselves in. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So our application for um, our next episode is as you've identified your core beliefs, right, that have come out of um, the the traumas, reflect on how these traumas have shaped these beliefs, right? Think Mm -hmm. back, you know, what exactly maybe it's a type A trauma, type B, good absence of good or an absence of, or, or, or a bad thing happening, um, identify stuck points. So these are the incorrect schemas that need to be modified, right. And accommodated, not over accommodated or, um, assimilated and utilize the truth to change them, right. What the truth of what actually happened, the truth about, you know, what the, is said in the Bible about God, right. About, um, other people, which we also have a prior episode that touches on that as well. Um, Reflect on the post-traumatic growth that you've experienced. Write down those specific blessings, right? So I would say, you know, step one, start talking about it, right? As I mentioned before, write about it. Step two, start challenging. And then step three is start recognizing those blessings. Mm -hmm. And with that, you know, I'm so excited, Chriselle, because it's so encouraging to know that if people follow those steps, right, they will find healing and deep-rooted healing of not just the roots, but the soil that can continue to feed their new trees that they wish to to 
to grow and, and to fertilize and um, just so encouraging. I, I love this episode and um, I'm hoping that a lot of people can find healing. Yes, yes. So we just want to remind you to subscribe, follow, share with a friend. As we mentioned early in this episode, all of us have had some sort of experience with trauma and if not directly, indirectly. And so this can be applicable to anyone out there. And so if you know of someone who's hurting, please share this particular episode. Um, and just a reminder, we are on Audioverse now. And so sometimes we may not have the ability to see a video or it may drain our phones. <laughs> it happens to me. Um, and so Audioverse may be more practical for you. And so just don't forget that we are also on Audioverse. Okay, well, thank you for joining us for this episode. And as we always mention, right, don't forget to take your daily dosage of the truth because you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And amen to that. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.